Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome to The Amazing World of Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Well, today we're going to bring you the second part of Columbia Workshop's adaptation of Alice's Adventures uh, Through the Looking Glass. Uh, the original air date is December 30th, 1937. Let's go ahead and take a listen. The Columbia Workshop. <laughs> Tonight, in presenting the second part of its radio extraction of Lewis Carroll's fantasy, After Adventures Through the Looking Glass, the Columbia Workshop continues an experiment begun last autumn when it presented Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. These classics are being broadcast in an effort to determine just how far music can substitute for sound effects. In tonight's presentation, as was the case last week, all sound effects are executed by orchestral instruments and are a part of the musical score especially written for the broadcast by Lee Stevens and Paul Starrett. The Columbia Workshop wants to know how successful this experimental broadcast has been. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and criticism. The Columbia Workshop presents Through the Looking Glass. had been playing Let's Pretend again. And while she was pretending that the black kitten was really the red queen in her chest set, and that she really could get through the mirror in the looking glass house, it happened. And she found herself walking through the looking glass and out into a lovely garden where the flowers talked and where she met the red queen who instructed her how to travel across the land that looks like a chessboard. You go very quickly through the third square, by railway, I should think, and you'll find yourself in the fourth square in no time. Well, that square belongs to Tweedledee and Tweedledum. The fifth is mostly water, the sixth belongs to Humpty Dumpty, the seventh is all forest, but the white knight will show you the way. And in the eighth square, we shall all be queens and it's all feasting and fun. So Alice ran down the hill, jumped a little brook, and found herself in a railway station. No sooner had the train pulled out, and it jumped too. And Alice was in the fourth square with Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Train Tweedledum and Tweedledee, a great to have a battle for. Tweedledum said Tweedledee, and swallowed his nice new rattle. Down a monstrous crow, and blacked in the tar barrel, which frightened both the heroes so they quite forgot their quarrel. And the monstrous crow did frighten the heroes, and poor Alice was left all alone, hiding under a tree. As the great bird went flying by, its wings kicking up a hurricane which blew someone shawl right past her. Alice caught it, and while she was looking for the owner, the white queen came running along, arms stretched out wide. Make sure, make sure. Here you are, ma'am. Uh, may I help you put it on, ma'am? Uh, your Majesty? For I am addressing the white queen, aren't I? Well, yes, if you call that a dressing, it isn't my notion of a thing at all. Here, let me do it. Oh, 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 oh dear, my finger is bleeding. Oh. What's the matter? Have you picked it? No, I haven't picked it yet, but soon I shall. Oh! When did you expect to do it? When I finally fastened my jaw. The boat was in and done directly. Oh, oh, now there, what did I tell you? It's open now. Oh, take care. You're holding it all crooked. Oh, there, it's tricky, you see? Well, that accounts for the bleeding. But why don't you scream now? Why, I've done all the screaming already. But that's all backwards. First, you should fix 
your finger and then scream. Oh, that's so perfectly silly. I should fall that way backwards. Well, in any case, I hope your finger's better now. No, oh, much better. Better, better, better. Alice looked at the white kid in astonishment. Then she rubbed her eyes and looked again. She was in a little dark shop, leaning with her elbows on the counter, and opposite her was an old chief, sitting in an armchair, knitting, and every now and then leading off to look at her through a great pair of spectacles. Oh, oh, you must buy something. You're holding everybody up. Why, there's no one else here but me. Indeed. Oh, Lord, you know about it. What do you want to buy? Well, do you have any eggs? Certainly. How do you sell them? Across the counter in exchange for money. I mean, how much are they? I spend starting for one. Two cents for two. Then two are cheaper than one? Certainly. Only you must eat them both if you buy two. Oh, then I'll have one, please. For I might not like them, you know. Here's your money. You say as my egg. Oh, I never put things into people's hands. That would never do. You must get it for yourself. It's yonder on a shelf at the back of the store. <laughs> I wonder why it wouldn't do. Couldn't it? The egg seems to get further away the more I walk toward it. And it's so dark back here. Oh, this must be a chair I'm running into. What? I declare it's got branches. How hard to find trees growing in the shop. And actually, here's a little brook. Well, this is the clearest shop I ever saw. So she went on, wondering more and more at every step, as everything turned into a tree the moment she came up to it. And she quite expected the egg to do the same. <laughs> However, the egg only got larger and larger and more and more human. When she had come within a few yards of it, she saw that it had eyes and a nose and mouth. And when she had come quite close to it, she saw clearly that it was Humpty Dumpty himself. It can't be anybody else. Sitting there on the wall, and suddenly he is exactly like an egg. It's very provoking to be called an egg, very. I said you looked like an egg, sir. And some eggs are very pretty, you know. Some people have no more sense than a baby. State your name, address, and occupation. My name is Alice, but... It's a stupid name enough. What does it mean? Must the name mean something? Of course it must. My name means the shape I am. And a good handsome shape it is, too. A name like yours, <laughs> you might be any shape almost. There's glory for you. I don't know what you mean by glory. Well, of course you don't, shall I tell you? I mean, there's a nice knockdown argument for you. But glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument. When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean. Nothing more, no less. The question is whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is which is to be master, that's all. For instance, would you like to hear a song in which words really work over time? Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> was really and the spicy cold did dire and gimbal in the wave all men were the pearl of gold and the warm red outrage see where the jabber walked my son with laws that like the stars of pet you wear the jub jub bird and son of Julius Sanders Mac. He took his horrible sword in hand. Long time the mansion pose he sought. So rest at ease by the tub tub sea and stood a while in thought. And as in selfish thought he stood, the Jabberwock with eyes of flame came whistling through the toadsy wood and burbled as he came. One, two, one, two, and two, and two, the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead 
And when it ended, he went galumping back and passed out playing the Jabberwock. Come to my arms, my Phoenix boy, oh, brave to stay, so loose, so lay, he startled in his joy. Ha, 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 ha. thrilling, and the slimy toad did gyre and gimble in the wave all the poor old gold and the moon ran out. <laughs> My, how well, what do you think of that? I'm sorry, but it doesn't seem to make much sense. Then why it makes perfect sense? I don't know the meaning of half the word. Oh, you don't know the meaning? Well, that doesn't mean it doesn't make sense. Although I will agree, there are some hard words there. Really, for instance. Now, brillig means four o'clock in the afternoon, the time you begin whirling things for dinner. Then what does slithy mean? Well, slithy means live and slimy. Live is the same as active. You see, it's like a portmanteau. There are two meanings packed up in one word. Oh, I see it now. And what are toads? Well, toads are something like badgers. There's something like lizards, and there's something like corks. They must be very joyous-looking creatures. They are, but also they make their nests under sundown. Also, they live on cheese. And what to gyre and to gimble? To gyre is to go round and round like a gyroscope. Gimble is to make holes like a gimbal. And the wave is the drop top round the sundial, I suppose? Of course it is. It's called wave, you know, because it goes a long way before it and a long way behind it. And a long way beyond it on each side. Exactly so. Well, mimsy means flimsy and miserable. But there's another portmanteau for it. And a bar of gold is a thin, shabby-looking bird with its feathers sticking out all around. Something like a live mop. And then mom wrath. Well, a wrath is a sort of green thing. But mom, I'm not certain about. I think it's short for from home. Meaning that they'd lost their way, you know. And what does outgrabe mean? Outgrabing is something between bellowing and whistling, with a kind of sneeze in the middle. However, you'll hear it done maybe someday. Then you'll never forget it. I'm afraid I'm giving you a great deal of trouble. Indeed you are. Good day. And Humpty Dumpty shut his eyes. Alice waited a minute to see if he would speak again, but as he never opened his eyes or took any further notice of her, she said goodbye a couple of times, and getting no answer, she quietly walked away. She couldn't help saying to herself as she went, Of all the unsatisfactory... She repeated this out loud as it was a great comfort to have such a long word to say. Of all the unsatisfactory people I ever met... She never finished the sentence. For at this moment, Alice's thoughts were interrupted. A knight, dressed in crimson armor, came galloping down upon her, brandishing a great club. A horse! A horse, Church! Oh, you're my prisoner. You're my... The red knight had tumbled off his horse, so Alice looked around with some concern for the new enemy. This time it was a white knight. He drew up at Alice's side and tumbled off his horse, too. The two knights sat and looked at each other for some time without speaking. Alice looked from one to the other in some bewilderment. She's my prisoner, you know. Yes, but then I came and rescued her. Well, you yeah, must yeah, fight for her then. Put on your helmet. Why, they're held up for the shape of a horse's head. Uh, you will observe the rules of battle, of course. Are you always do? <laughs> I wonder now what the rules of battle are. One rule seems to be that if one knight hits the other, he knocks him off his horse. And if he misses, he tumbles off himself. And another rule seems to be that they hold their clubs with their arms, as if they were parts of duty. What a noise they make when they tumble. Just like a whole set of fire iron falling into the fender. Now, why is the horse be wrong? They let them get on and off themselves as if they were tables. A 
Another rule of battle that Alice had not noticed seemed to be that they always fell on their heads. And the battle ended with their both falling off in this way, side by side. When they got up again, they shook hands. And then the Red Knight mounted and galloped off. It was a glorious victory, wasn't it? I don't know. I don't want to be anybody's prisoner. I want to be a queen. But so you will when you cross the next brook. I'll see you safe to the end of the wood, and then I must go back, you know. That's the end of my move. Thank you very much. May I help you off with your helmet? <laughs> ah, thank you. Ah, now one can breathe more easily. Alice thought she had never seen such a strange-looking soldier in all her life. He pushed back his shaggy hair with both hands and turned his gentle face and large, mild eyes to Alice. He was dressed in thin armor, which seemed to fit him very badly, and he had a queer-shaped little deal box fastened across his shoulders, upside down, and with the lid hanging open. Alice looked at it with great curiosity. I see you admiring my little box. It's my own invention to keep clothes and sandwiches in, upside down, so that the rain can't get in. But the thing can get out. Do you know the lid, though? Oh, I didn't know it. Then all the things must have fallen out, and the box is no use without them. Then why are you hanging it so carefully on the tree? In hopes some bees may make a nest in it. Then I should get the honey. But you've got a beehive. Or something like one fastened to the saddle. Yes, and it's a very good beehive. One of the best kinds. But not a single bee has come near it yet. And the other thing is a mouse trap. I suppose the mice keep the bees out or the bees keep mice out. I, I don't know which. I was wondering what the mouse trap was for. It isn't very likely there would be any mice on the horse's back. Not very likely, perhaps. But if they do come, I don't choose to have them running all around. Now, you see, it is well to be provided for everything. That's the reason the horse has all those anchors around his feet. But what are they for? To guard against the bites of sharks. It's an invention of my own. And now, uh, help me on. I'll go with you to the end of the wood. It took a long time to get the knight in his saddle because he was so very awkward. And because the saddle was already loaded with bunches of carrots and fire irons and many other things. But at last they accomplished it and started off through the forest. Whenever the horse stopped, which it did very often, he fell off in front. <laughs> And whenever it went on again, which it generally did rather suddenly, he fell off behind. Otherwise, he kept on pretty well, except that he had a habit of now and then falling off sideways. And as he generally did this on the side on which Alice was walking, he soon found that it was the best plan not to walk quite so close to the horse. As Alice helped the white knight up the fifth time, she ventured to say, I'm afraid you've not had much practice in riding. Now, what makes you say that? Because people don't fall off quite so often when they've had much practice. I've had plenty of practice. Plenty of practice. Indeed. The great art of riding is to keep... Here the sentence ended as suddenly as it had begun, as the knight fell heavily on the top of his head exactly in the path where Alice was walking. She was quite frightened this time and said in an anxious tone as she picked him up. Oh, I hope no bones are broken. Oh, none to speak of. The great art of riding, as I was saying, is to keep your balance properly. Like this, you know. He let go the bridle and stretched out both his arms to show Alice what he meant. And this time he fell flat on his back, right under the horse's feet. As Alice was getting him on his feet again, he kept repeating... Plenty of practice. Plenty of practice. Oh, it's too ridiculous. You ought to have a wooden horse on wheels. That you are. Uh, does that kind go smoothly? Much more smoothly than a live horse. I I'll get one. One or two. Several. I'm a great hand at inventing things. Now, uh, I dare say you noticed the last time you picked me up that I was looking rather thoughtful. You were a little grave. Well, just then, I was inventing a new way of getting over a gate. Uh, would you like to hear it? Oh, very much indeed. You see, I said to myself, the only difficulty is with the feet. Now, the head is high enough already. Now, first, I put my head on top of the gate. Then the head's high enough. Then I stand on my head. And then the feet are high enough, you see. Then, I'm over, you see. Yes, 
I suppose you'd be over when that was done, but don't you think it would be rather hard? Well, I haven't tried it yet, so I can't tell for certain. But, oh, you ought to get along. Perhaps I'd better leave. Oh, you needn't rush off. No, but I must. And you've only a few yards to go down the hill and over with that little brook, and then you'll be a queen. Uh, but you'll stay and see me off first. I, I shan't be long. You'll wait and wave your handkerchief when I get to that turn in the road. Oh, I think it has encouraged me, you see. Of course I'll wait. And thank you very much for coming so far. So they shook hands and in the night rode slowly away into the forest. It won't take long to see him off, I expect. So Alice stood watching the horse walking leisurely along the road and the night tumbling off, first on one side and then on the other. After the fourth or fifth tumble, he reached the turn and then she waved her handkerchief to him, waited till he was out of sight. Then she turned around and started to run down the hill. I hope it encouraged him. And now for the last brook and to be a queen. How grand it sounds. And Alice ran the west way down the hill, and when she came to the little brook, she jumped. And found herself standing before a great arched doorway, on which the words, Queen Alice, were carved and on the other side of which she heard voices singing. In her hand she carried a scepter, and on her head she wore a great golden crown. She was indeed at last a queen, but a slightly puzzled one, for at either side of the great door was a bell, and one was marked Visitor's Bell, and the other Servant's Bell. Hmm. Now which bell shall I ring? I'm not a visitor, and I'm not a servant. There ought to be one more queen, you know. Oh, it's all right. Someone's opening it. No admittance till we go up the next. Oh, the impertinence. And Alice knocked and rang in vain for a long time, until at last the very old frog who was sitting under a tree got up and slowly hobbled up to her. What is it now? There's the servant whose business it is to answer this door. Which door? This door, of course. What's it been asking? I don't know what you mean. I speaks English, doesn't I? Or are you deaf? What did it ask you? Nothing. I've been knocking at it. Shouldn't do that. Shouldn't do that at all. Wexes it, you know. Let it alone, and it'll let you alone. But just at this moment, the door flew open of its own accord, and Alice looked in on the banquet hall, just as another song began. Go in, that's right. But as soon as 
valley prepared a cheery stop. And all the guests, birds and beasts and flowers, watched Alice in silence as she took her place between the Red Queen and the White Queen at the head of the table. It's nice of you to give my party for me, Your Red Majesty. I should never have known who were the right people to invite. You've missed the soup and fish. Put on the joint. Your oint, Your Majesty. You look a little shy. Let me introduce you to this leg of mutton. Alice, mutton. Mutton, Alice. And the leg of mutton got up in the dish and made a little bow to Alice. And Alice returned the bow, not quite sure whether this was the right thing to do or not. May I, uh... Give you a slice, Your Majesty? Certainly not. It isn't etiquette to cut anyone you've been introduced to. Remove the joints and bring on the pudding. I won't be introduced to the pudding, please, or we shall get no dinner at all. The, 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 the pudding, Your Majesty. Pudding, Alice. Alice, pudding. Remove the pudding. Waiter, bring back the pudding. The, the, the pudding, Your Majesty. Now, Your Majesty, here is a slice. A pudding for you. What impertinence. I wonder how you'd like it if I were to cut a slice out of you, you little creature. Why, uh, uh, make a remark. It's ridiculous to leave all the conversation with the pudding. What shall I say? Nothing. You'll drink your health instead. Queen Alice's help. <laughs> You ought to return thanks in a neat speech. Must I? Oh, of course. Very well. I rise to return thanks. And Alice really did rise. As she spoke, she felt herself grow several inches. And she just managed to pull herself down by the edge of the table. Take care of yourself. Something's going to happen. And something did happen. Many things. The candles grew until they became huge fireworks, and the bottles took place and fixed them on his wings, and with forks for legs began fluttering around the room. And the leg of mutton usurped the white queen's chair, while Alice just had a glimpse of her majesty's good-natured face grinning at her over the edge of the soup tureen before she disappeared for the third time into the soup. Something had to be done, for several of the guests were lying in the dishes, and the soup tureen was walking up the table toward Alice, beckoning her impatiently to get out of the way. And she seized the tablecloth with both hands and gave it a good pull. And gifts and dishes and plates and candles came crashing down in a heap on the floor. Alice turned to look for the Red Queen, whom she considered somehow to be the cause of it all. But Her Majesty went to the size of a doll and was running merrily around the table after her own shawl. Alice grabbed her up. As for you, I'll shake you into a kitten. I will. She took the Red Queen off the table and shook her back and forth with all her might. The Red Queen made no resistance whatever. Only her face grew very small, and her eyes got large and green. And still as Alice kept on shaking her, she kept growing shorter and fatter and softer and rounder. And it really was a kitten. Oh, oh, your red majesty shouldn't purr so loud. Oh, oh, you woke me out of such a nice dream. <laughs> and you've been along with me, Kitty, all through the looking glass world. Did you know? <laughs> So ends the Columbia Workshop's presentation of Through the Looking Glass, which was extracted for radio and directed by William N. Robeson. The special musical score was composed by Lee Stevens and Paul Starrett, and Miss Helen Clare played Alice. We want to know what you think of this program. Please address your comments, criticisms, and suggestions to the Columbia Workshop, care of the Columbia Network, New York City. Beginning next week, 
The Columbia Workshop will be heard on Saturday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget the workshop's new series of experimental broadcasts begins a week from Saturday, January 8th, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, uh, an interesting request for feedback, and I actually uh, liked it, uh, the way that they were doing and what they were doing over the radio was the type of thing that Disney would do with uh, films when they got into releasing things such as uh, Fantasia. This idea of using music to tell the story and communicate uh, things like sound effects. And of course, in a lot of the Disney films, uh, it was used, you know, as a substitute for dialogue where, you know, I, and obviously you can't do that over radio, but if you're, you're watching some of these uh, Disney films, you can just kind of imagine what's being said based on the music being played. Overall, I thought that... Uh, these were pretty solid, faithful adaptations. At times, you could feel like it was almost slave to the text without any thought to, okay, what's going to actually work best for radio? But uh, I think because they are so faithful to the underlying stories, uh, it's Definitely a lot of fun to listen to, and as I said in the previous podcast, Through the Looking Glass just has some fantastic uh, uh, poetry, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, we've got one more episode in our Alice series. Join us back here next week, where we'll bring you Lux Radio Theater's uh, version of the Disney version of Alice uh, in Wonderland. So uh, be sure and listen to that. Uh, we'll be back next Wednesday. If you do have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.